Hello, I'm Rory McKiernan, author of Hitching for Hope, coming to you from County Clare on the wild west coast of Ireland. You're very welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. Welcome back to all you regular listeners, folk from throughout Ireland, France, Norway, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Korea, Argentina, Zambia, and any one of the 50 plus countries where people have been tuning in from. It's great to have you here listening to the podcast and a very big welcome to new listeners. Do check out the archives when you finish this great episode and a huge thanks as always to all you wonderful patrons and supporters who chip in to support the podcast over at Love and courage.org. Before we get going, I want to share some good news with you. My book, Hitching for Hope, recently picked up a Best Book Award from the American Book Fest, and it was also chosen as Book of the Month by IrishCentral.com. So great to have this new momentum behind the book and to get all those stories and messages of hope, community, connection and kindness out rippling out into the world again. So more info on the book. If you haven't come across it yet, you'll find lots of information, reviews and everything online and you can buy it as an ebook, audio book and paperback and more information on hitchingforhope.com or your local bookstore should have it. My guest in this episode is Kindred Motes. Kindred is an award-winning social impact entrepreneur and an inspirational voice for change from working class rural Alabama in the southern United States. After approximately a decade working with some of the world's leading social justice organizations, Kindred recently established the Washington DC based KM Strategies Group to support organizations working for social impact and positive change. I first encountered Kindred many years ago when he was working with the Wallace Global Fund and I was really struck by his intellect, his passion, his insight, his drive and his deep commitment to change on so many issues including LGBT. LGBTQI plus rights, which has been informed by his own experiences growing up gay in the Deep South. Kindred is also passionate about mental health supports, immigration reform, democracy, participation and amplifying citizens' voices in general. He also has a lot to say on the topic of burnout and well-being and how we can create healthier and more appealing workplace cultures, something I think is particularly important in the world today when there's so much stress and burnout among us. So uh, you'll get to hear lots more of his thoughts around that. I really enjoyed this conversation with Kindred and I want to say a huge congrats to him and his partner also on their recent engagement. May to be very happy together. We're all about celebrating the love here on the Love and Courage podcast podcast. Now, without further ado, let's jump in and get started with this conversation with Kindred Motes. Kindred, you're very welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. I want to jump in straight away and ask you what you've probably been asked so many times before and maybe tired of answering, but it is, I would just love to know about your name, not just your first name, but also your last name. Oh, uh, sure. So, uh, well, thanks. Thanks so much, Rui, for having me. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely something that I've I've been asked a lot, usually in in a queue um, at, at Starbucks or somewhere else, trying to get a coffee when I'm having to spell it. But Kindred, which is my first name, came from my great great grandfather, and it was his middle name. It's a, so it's an old family name. People often ask me whether my parents were hippies or you know they met at um, some some seventies uh, music festival or something. But no, it's um, it's an old family name. And then my last name is um, originally, I think, as best I can tell, was originally French uh, and was Delamont, but then became Motes in England, um, and then they moved from England to the Carolinas in, um, in the, in, in the, uh, the States where I, where I live and, and have been in the, in the country for, for quite some time. But I think as best I can tell, uh, the rest of my family were, were kind of a mixture of, um, Irish, Scottish, English, you know, the, the amalgamation that we, that we're famously known for, uh, in Appalachia and, and the South. So. Wow. That's yeah. very interesting. So I, <laughs> can I, I'm going to make a guess to say you haven't met too many or any kindreds has it happened i have not i have not i uh i've i've seen a lot of companies and brands recently that have come up with a name and, and have joked with some friends that i made very poor decisions in my late teens and early 20s and i probably should have uh try have tried to uh trademark a couple of those things mm. i'm uh but uh you know I, I guess that's just one of the things that happens but no i've never i've never met another kindred i would love to that'd be maybe we should find like a little 
a little group of, of kindreds around the world and have, well, a, have a little convening. <laughs> <laughs> on that topic, um, there aren't that many Ruries. They do exist in Ireland. There's, they are around and internationally, but uh, I guess Rory is the more commonly known English language version. Um, but there was a guy on Instagram uh, called Rory who set up a group of Rory's on Instagram <laughs> and tried to create a, a dialogue. But I, I have to admit, I didn't have sufficient interest in, in having this Rory group. <laughs> and then I have noticed another guy whose Instagram handle, I hope he doesn't mind me quoting it, but I, I'll probably promote him in doing so. His um his Instagram handle is the real Rory, so I guess he's oh. like, he's laying claim to uh, <laughs> shots fired. Yeah, 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 big time, <laughs> big time. Uh, so that does not surprise me that brands are hooking on to that name, uh, because what really strikes me about it, and and we're not going to make this a podcast about your name, so we will move on. <laughs> you can trust me on that, but um. Yeah, it, like it, when I say it, when I see it, it it, it sort of evokes a, a positive, warm sentiment, and that that must be a good thing. I mean, do you benefit from that? Yeah, you know, it's it's something that I've I've actually wondered before. I, I think particularly as I was first starting to, as a young adult, apply for jobs and and meet people, and um, I had a lot of people who very early on when I would meet them would ask me when I changed my name or when I decided to go by that name, because I think they thought that it wasn't my real name. I think that there, and particularly in, in a lot of Southern families, there's a, a tendency to, to try and use old family names. And I think as a result, sometimes people sound a little archaic in their, in their name or something, mm -hmm. you know, in a way that it doesn't really hit the modern ear as, as being, um, being current or, or, or something they've heard before. And I wondered a lot of times whether how much your name or your kind of environment determines your destiny and i know that there's a lot of ways you can you can slice and dice that but especially your name like does it determine what what sort of fields you are welcomed into what sort of people you work with who takes you seriously who doesn't and i you know i it's hard to it's hard to um evaluate in the abstract because i feel like a lot of mm. uh, a lot of what could have been is is completely unknown but but i do think about it especially given that i've worked so much in in movement communications and advocacy communications in mm. social justice campaigns whether the idea of of being kind of a kindred or a kindred spirit or a collective you know kindred which became kin at least in in um in the U.S. is is how, and especially in the South, is how we would talk about being family. Uh, we would say, you know, oh, I'm kin to him, mm. and that would mean that he's my family member. He's part mm. of my community, mm. and so yeah, I think it's it's interesting to think about the funny ways in which sometimes life kind of imitates the the situational things that aren't actually a choice for you. You know, mm. maybe I didn't choose that name, but but the things that happened afterwards kind of chose me because of it. And and I don't know the extent to which I, you know, give that that theory too much credit, but I do think about it sometimes. And it's interesting. It's mm -hmm. funny that you that you ask because I because I think it is it is something that maybe does hit a a social justice or a justice oriented person mm -hmm. as being particularly evocative, maybe. Yeah. And and there are so many aspects to our identities and our formation that were handed and born with and given and I suppose socialized with and, and names being one of them and religions perhaps being another and mm. things that perhaps we had no choice over as a child, you know. So yeah, there's you mentioned a couple of times already your um your I suppose your southern origins and I definitely got a distinct sense of identity and a and a distinct culture there as well. And I think those of us that aren't from the United States, um, probably we get stereotypical views of, of the United States as an ent as an entity, as a, as a country. Um, and my experience of the States is that there is no singular uh, entity insofar as there are multiple states with multiple regional cultures and variations and there's indigenous culture and there's African-American or Latino culture and Southern culture. And, and then we, we talk about Irish America, but we rarely talk about the Appalachian version that you referenced there. And mm. then the mashup that we hear in old time music and fiddle music and all the yeah. confluence that goes on there. But it obviously is a, an important uh, part of your life in. Well, I, I, I certainly detect that or has been 
an important part of your life, like your identity, your origins, as they are for everybody, really. But, um, you know, being given the name and, and it's speaking to tradition. Um, so I'd like to just get a better sense of what traditions you are from and what what your family origins are, what, what you grew up in and around. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate that question. I, I think um, it's something that so I grew up in in Alabama and in, in northern Alabama and and in particular in a in a small, very small, extremely rural community. I think I had about uh, four hundred and fifty to five hundred people who lived in in my community, but that was over a, a great um, distance and, and and people were sort of very um, sparsely located kind of uh, across the across the area so it wasn't even technically a town or you know a village or or anything um that that would be common elsewhere but i grew up um my my grandparents were were farmers my my dad uh and my mom all uh my mom and dad lived near my grandparents my entire family kind of all lived within a very short driving distance from each other and that sense of of closeness and community was always so formative i think in how i thought about the world and how i thought about closeness and community and family and i remember watching tv as a as a kid um young kid in in the early 90s and and seeing people traveling uh to you know to to other places or or having next door neighbors and and all of those things, you know, traveling for the holidays mm-hmm. to go to their grandparents mm-hmm. and um, or going next door to to play basketball with their neighbors after school. And neither of those were really accessible references for me because I neither had to travel to visit family, nor did I have a next door neighbor. So I think I, you know, I, I grew up in an extremely rural place. And I think that was very formative. It's interesting that you mentioned the the power of the the connection between southern or appalachian music and and uh, scots irish music i think that that is something that was a very prominent presence in my life i grew up in a very musical family <clears throat> my dad and and his family sang as um when my dad was a child and and you know in church and and traveled kind of singing together my mom and her three sisters uh or her her sisters uh sang and my grandmother played the piano and and they all were very informed i think by music and the cultural heritage that had been passed down to them and there's i remember being really really interested when i when i got to college in in listening to some of the old uh, english irish scottish folk songs and finding that similarity and it felt like i was going home even though i would be thousands of miles away at uh, at the time i i li- went to graduate school over in over in the uk and you know, just finding those similarities really, mm. I think, drove home for me the universality of 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 music, of of connection, and and the ways in which we think of ourselves as very different, but but we're really not. Um, and a lot of the songs that that you know my grandparents or great grandparents would have sung to me when I was a small child or baby were songs that you know someone was singing in Ireland three hundred years ago, and yeah. the only thing that had changed was they were being sung with a southern accent um, in, in, mm. instead of an Irish one. So. I think about that a lot and and I think the for a very long time for me I was I I'm ashamed to say it now but I think I was I was a bit averse to being identified as as southern because of the things that I felt kind of came with that in the form of baggage or or you know the the assumptions that people would make about you and so I worked very very hard uh at at the age of 14 15 to get rid of my accent and to not sound like I was from the South because I, I had been made fun of for, for it when I would go away to conferences or to other things with people from, from other parts of the country. And I, I realized early on that at least at that point in time, you could either have a Southern accent or you could be considered intelligent. And, you know, I, I um, mm. didn't see a lot of room for, for keeping both. And, and it's one of, it may sound silly, but I think it's one of my biggest regrets from that, from that period that I wish I had kept it because I think it, mm. it would be a powerful counterexample to the stereotype. If, you know, imagine you have someone who works in advocacy and movements and, yeah. and didn't change that about themselves. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly don't think you're alone in that. And I think we 
have some very high profile <laughs> examples of political leaders that have downplayed their accent and also then upplayed their accent or returned to their accent when mm. it suited them. And <laughs> I suppose I mean that mix myself in that I'm from a very um, relatively rural part of Ireland and uh, it has a very distinct accent and I, I can't say I have it anymore. I don't remember ever trying to consciously change it, but I suppose uh, I, I've been gone from there over 20 years and it, it, I don't know, it just it just kind of f filtered out. But it there there to the finely tuned ear, they'll pick up bits and pieces of it. But I, I definitely have come to have a greater appreciation of diversity. Like we're talking about diversity in general uh, and accents are another representation of diversity. And why do we want a sort of a mono culture of anything? Um, yeah. You know, but I, I definitely like that is so distinct within the cultural and political output of the United States that we do hear a northern version of reality, you know, mm. um, and that Absolutely. idea that, you know, also implicit in that is pro possibly some sort of urban v rural and urban mm. being progress and rural being regress. But yet the ru the urban folk are highly dependent on the rural fo folk for the food that they eat and the shelter that they have and every other thing. And mm. I think that's being played out, particularly I noticed during the pandemic when people were fearing that they would have no food on their shelves. Suddenly there was a new appreciation for rural folk who <laughs> exactly. get their food. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so true. I, you, you, you become very accustomed to ignoring people who are not convenient for you or who don't exist as part of your everyday life until you get to the point where you have to and you can no longer ignore it. And I think that's, I think that's very true. I also think that that dynamic is is part of what has allowed th those rural communities i think often to get involved or support you know political movements or or leaders who you know aren't advocating on their behalf in 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 the way that they think they are because they they feel so sort of marginalized or ignored by by other people that they you know someone shows them an ounce of attention and mm -hmm. and um and they're they're very vulnerable to you know, to, to whatever it is that person is, is peddling. Yeah, it's a very good point. So, uh, Kendra, going back to the, the family roots, I'm, I'm, I have a real distinct visual that you painted there, you know, from that that sort of sparsely populated uh, area and, and the musicality also. And did that influence your life directly in the sense that did you, did you take up music or song or dance or anything like that? I did, yeah. I, I, grew, up, I grew up singing all the time and uh, it's something I only really do in the shower these days but uh but i i was in uh involved in in music and singing all throughout school um both in in primary school secondary school and then in um in college i had a scholarship to be part of a vocal group and and that was part of what allowed me to to afford uh going going to college um when i was when i was there so i had to do weekly lessons and and be part of um, what was called a concert choir of, of a large group of people and then a 16 person acapella group. So I was one of the four baritone basses in, in the group and got to, got to learn a lot of, a lot of different musical styles. And it was interesting because I think for me, it had, it had always been a source of joy and, and comfort. And then it was kind of a requirement or a, a box ticking exercise for, you know, for being able to afford college. And, and it's interesting mm -hmm. when something becomes your job, I think you learn very quickly whether you love it or you hate it and whether the passion is is truly there or it isn't. And for me, I, I did I did truly love it. I think I I had the chance to realize that that music is a form in and of itself of communication, you know, and you can reach people in a really powerful way through through song, through through music, whether you're playing, whether you're singing, whether you're writing it. Um, and, and so that was, I think that was something that really, really did bring a lot of extra joy into my life. And, and even now as I'm, you know, just taking, taking breaks or finding ways to recharge, I, I often find that it's something that I turn to as a, as a sort of palliative or, or source of comfort when, mm -hmm. when things are going crazy, just to, you know, pop in my headphones, go for a walk and, and listen to something that is comforting to me, because I think that it, it, it does, it reminds me of home. It reminds me of my family and, and there's a very there's a very strong connection in my mind between things you pass down and things that that bring you kind of um, comfort and joy and strength and and music for me is, has always been one of those for sure. 
Well, I, I certainly predict a, a comeback here on the stage at some point, Kindred. I look forward to hearing the, <laughs> the musical version of this. Um, um, so you mentioned your family there. Can you talk to me a little bit more about what kind of people they, they were or are and what the influences were in the household and how did that affect your upbringing and what was young Kindred like beyond the music? What were you interested in and what were you up to and, and at what point did they the social consciousness entered the arena sure yeah i i um i think it's it's something that i think about a lot the the influence that my my parents in particular had on on my own thinking um my my mom was uh, a u.s postal service worker um when i was when i was born and, and for the first part of my life so she worked First, as a as a letter carrier um, or a post carrier, as I suppose most of your audience would uh, would say, and um, she was um, also w would uh, work as a as a clerk at the postal service, and and so at that point, that was something that that had been somewhat of a family uh, tradition. My grandmother was a was a letter carrier as well, and in the rural communities, that's something that you know you you may have uh, as well in Ireland is. Is, was really for a very, very long period of time, a lifeline for the communities because before the internet, it really was pretty radical and transformational that the US Postal Service would deliver to everywhere, yeah. um, anywhere in, in the country for the same for the same rate, you know, the cost of a stamp, you can get it wherever you need it to go. And, and that was really the only form of, of sort of social equity, I think a lot of uh, people benefited from because it was the only thing that that was even kind of no matter where you lived, whether you were whether you were in Manhattan or you were in Somerville, Alabama. So that was something that I, you know, um, later on in life, as I as I looked back, I realized that my own belief in in, in government and and the power of government to provide um, sort of radical innovations and solutions was brought on from that my dad um similarly my dad worked as a united auto workers employee he worked for um a series of gm general motors uh factories as an assembly line worker and um so both my parents had union jobs they you know worked as um as um working class you know everyday american workers and were extremely extremely hardworking people very very intelligent very kind um and you know they they instilled in me early on the the importance of hard work and and um and and being accountable but also being honest and i think that the um you know the the other piece of that of that puzzle is when my brother was born he's eight years younger than me my my mom took some time off from from the postal service um to to be at home with him and when she decided to go back to work she actually started her own small business and and had an antique shop um she had collected antiques and and kind of loved going to estate estate sales and you know flea markets and a bunch of other things when i was a kid which i was dragged along to and hated uh, as uh, as a as a kid i would stay in the car and read you know the latest Harry Potter book uh, for the third time or whatever else I could get my hands on because I, I was a voracious reader and, and still am. But she um, she started that small business and, and was um, in business in, in my hometown for, I think, around 15 years. And um, and since then has, has gone on to do other um, other small business work with my dad once he retired. But I think that's something that that was really an early example to me of, of entrepreneurship and and using relationships and community and, and the idea of being a responsible community member who has a business, giving back, donating, hosting community events, you know, using business not as a not as a mechanism for profit or for um, personal gain, but but as a as a way to you know make an honest living, provide for your family, but then also build relationships with people. Um, that's something that I think my mom learned from her father, who had a had a small business as well, selling um, tractor equipment and farm farm supply um, materials. And and so I grew up kind of around that, and I feel like it was steeped in me a bit. Where you know I would um, I would spend a lot of my time just just around them and seeing them conduct you know business with with people or in my town it was always you know somebody that we knew and they would pop in and and have a you know have a have a coca-cola and chat over something and maybe they bought something maybe they didn't but but it was very sociable um in terms of me as a young as a young kid i think i was i was always very outgoing and um and i i really loved 
finding ways to to travel even though i never i never f- uh flew in a plane until i was 18 and and have since then have have really tried to make up for lost time but i found a lot of adventure and escape and and knowledge through through reading and and my parents really nurtured that and i'm so grateful for it i think they they um probably knew from an early age that that i was kind of had my eye on somewhere else and and i you know i i think they could have been very negative about that but they weren't and um and so i i felt i had a lot of family support for for trying new things for for kind of coming into my own and i think the the social consciousness question was something that you know to be honest i i had a very in retrospect i i think of it as a golden childhood you know my my we weren't my family was not by any means rich or um or particularly privileged but i but i never wanted for anything and and they I, we had love and we had each other and you know they were hard working and, and had been fortunate to 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 be able to provide provide that environment for us but i think i i knew from an early age that um that there was a lot of suffering in the world and my parents you know i i was raised in the church and and my parents uh, faith was was and is um, very very important to them, and and so that that sense of giving giving back, doing what you can, meeting people where they are, and and the culture of service was something that I saw them live out daily, and um, you know I I have come to my own conclusions about about kind of faith and and belief systems and service and everything else but it very much was i think deeply rooted in their example and their experience mm-hmm. and and their selflessness um there but but the primary catalyst i think for me was was moving away and um i lived in birmingham alabama for um my undergraduate experience which most of your listeners will probably be somewhat familiar with as as the sort of um hotbed and and birthplace of the civil rights movement uh birmingham montgomery and atlanta kind of collectively as the triumvirate mm-hmm. but birmingham in particular being the place of um you know the the, the church bombings and the um the bull connor as the police commissioner and the fire hoses being used on families and children and and, and dogs and all of those those horrible things from from the you know period that that's not that uh, in in the not that distant past that was within living memory of of my parents and grandparents and i was involved in a class um, called civil rights and justice with uh, with one of the original civil rights organizers from from that period and you know, it, it, it was an amazing and deeply immersive way to very quickly shatter my sense of, of what my state was, my community was, my history was. And, you know, it's interesting that you kind of started the conversation with the question about my name, because, you know, my, my great, great grandfather who had my name was in Alabama you know, in the 1800s. And so the, when you think about legacy and history and the things that come with that and the responsibilities that come with that, I think I felt this immense kind of baggage and, and, and pressure to, to do something with that, not to just, not to be racked by guilt over it or, or to throw up my hands and, and give up, but, but to channel it into something that felt productive and meaningful in the present day. Um, and I think that that's, a lot of people who respond negatively to to these ideas of justice or equity, I think, are too instantly sort of internalizing the blame, I guess, and, and they respond defensively rather than 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 looking at it and saying, you know what, none of us chose the world that we woke up in this morning, but we can choose how we respond to it and how we how we try and make it a better place, how we try and make it more equitable. And so that 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 period in my life, I think, was really, really instrumental in setting me on this path because I think I had been very insulated from the world, not in a not in a sense of you know financial privilege, but I think just in isolation, living in a very, very remote place, living um, with people who were all very, very much like me. And getting into a city, you know, getting into a metro with 1.2 million people, hearing about the history of the state and and our our kind of collective involvement and complicity in that really, really, um, I think, spurred for me a lot of deep thinking about the world that I lived in and the world I wanted to try and help create. Mm. Did you feel any um, sense of separation or tension uh, in terms of how the younger kindred was um, 
I suppose, changing uh, course or going on a different path than the family tradition or family business or even you reference there coming to your own ideas or conclusions around faith and belief. Um, were you aware of that sort of what you might call a separation or a transition? Uh, how did that play out? Yeah, I, th I think it's uh, it's something that is probably to some degree a universal experience of that, that everyone can relate to of of understanding that as you grow, as you experience new things, you aren't going to be the same person that your that your parents are, right? Or that your your family kind of on a on a composite level maybe maybe um is. And and that's something that definitely tracked for me. I mean, I think I I knew at an early age that um and by early age I I, I guess here I mean probably around middle school period that there was something different about me um that was different from my peers and and i you know I, I i knew that i was gay and at the time that was something that was very i think very difficult in in the deep south in the rural south in the extremely religious communities and mm -hmm. um and so i lived i think with a lot of fear and a lot of shame and a lot of um repression for a long period of time where i was really beating myself up about how I had, you know, at the time kind of felt that who I was, was somehow some sort of moral failing. And I, I didn't want to disappoint anyone because I, I feel like I'm very much a, a type A, you know, extremely detail oriented, ambitious person and, and, and always have been. And, and I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong in that, mm -hmm. in that situation. And so I think that led to a lot of pulling back or isolation from from the the traditions or the norms or the the expectations and i think that it you know to the to the question that you posed earlier about social awakenings i do think that it was probably one of the earliest realizations that gave me certainly not an identical perspective at all but i think it gave me a, a sense of empathy for people who are dealing with something that makes them you know, marginalized or feeling like they're an outsider in a situation, feeling like they don't have the support system they need, or they don't have the the right tools to, to figure out how to get what they need personally. So it it gave me that sense. And I and I never wanted anyone to ever feel like that, that I, you know, to the extent that I could could be involved and help and avoid that. I never wanted anyone to ever feel isolated, to feel alone, to feel judged or marginalized or um, afraid. And, and I think that that, that experience was, um, you know, frankly, pa I think painful for all parties. I think it was painful for my family. It was painful for me. And the, the, the most painful part of everything, I think was every single person in, in, in the dynamic deeply, deeply loved each other and deeply cared about each other and was just coming at the situation from vastly different perspectives, lived experiences, backgrounds, you know, cultural influences, religious influences. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I try to use that as a touch point when I, when I talk about my own kind of work in social justice and, and connecting with communities that maybe don't share your views, because I do think that so often, and especially in the, in the social justice world, we talk with people who agree with us. We have lunch with people who agree with us. We listen to podcasts hosted by people who agree with us. And really that's, that's not very hard to do. Um, what's hard to do is, is to have conversations that are tough with people who don't agree with you, but love you, you know, and, and finding a way to square that circle to, to, to kind of push through the, the discomfort and, and love as a verb, not just as an emotion. And I think that that's, you know, what my family and I have done with each other. It, it's very um, complex and complicated as I think all families probably are, but but I have deep, deep love for them. And, and I know that they have it for me. And, and so I think it, that experience has, has kind of driven a lot of my, a lot of my work. And I think a lot of my own, I, don't, I think maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later on around kind of how, how um, work culture can kind of, can kind of be a manifestation of personal experiences. But I think for a long time, my desire to kind of always be looking for the next thing or to achieve or to, to kind of, accomplish something was rooted in ultimately wanting to do enough, be enough, accomplish enough to kind of set that right. And part of my process of, of growing up and, and 
growing emotionally was just realizing that 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 was a sort of a fool's errand. You know, it's not. It wasn't ever that I wasn't doing enough or um, succeeding enough or um, any other thing. It was that that wasn't the issue. The issue was was finding a way to to be in a world, be in a community, be in a family where we were able to 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 move past that and realize that ultimately we don't have to agree but our job is to love each other our job is to support each other and and i think that that's something that i've tried to create in my lived communities and my adopted families as well is this sense of coming together out of shared experience shared purpose shared goals and making the metrics of success more about are we getting what we need from each other are we supporting each other not mm-hmm. are we accomplishing these you know arbitrary sets of metrics that um frankly aren't that important it did it, it seems so um prescient and, and relevant to particularly where the united states but not just the united states we could take any number of countries are in terms of divisiveness and the the need and referencing alabama but you know the notion of the beloved community of martin luther king and the mm. idea of seeing the goodness and the humanity in all and each other and I guess there's nowhere more difficult to, to some extent to start with than at home if the other is seen as off you. But, you know, by virtue of a nation state or indeed the world, we are all a sort of one family to, to one extent or another. Um, but the, the, the microcosm there of which played out in your family, and obviously this is very private and personal territory, so I don't expect you to kind of divulge too much on the specifics, but I'm just wondering, are there any particular um, tools or insights as to how you and your family navigated that uh, period in the early days? Because I, I do get a, well, I guess some of my own background is in, in youth work and I would have a sense of, um, you know, the repression and discrimination that has gone on and still goes on and how it can lead to internalized, whether it be anxiety or depression or suicide suicidology suicide ideation um particularly amongst lg lgbtqi plus communities and so on um so you know in this period you're you're a much younger man and Mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have access to supports or therapists or all of these things like uh, and Mm -hmm. and maybe your parents never did either and uh, like where do you develop the skill set or do you model your way through or you know was there anything there that maybe looking back that you think has um was pivotal yeah that's a that's a really i think profound question in a number of ways my my initial sense of of how to answer it i think is that i I don't know that I had the answer and I, and I don't know that there's um, a sort of playbook that, that people can use because I think every situation is, is, is unique. But what I will say is I think I, because of a unique combination of factors of, of how I sort of operate in the world and, and maybe that it, it, it isn't even that unique. I think um, there's a really good book on, on this topic that I read um, maybe a year or so ago called the velvet rage. And it's all about the, it's not a new book, but it's. Um, I think it's continually relevant. It's. It's all about how people who grow up um, gay, as the initially, I think, was the, the the kind of framing of of that book. But but LGBT, I think, more more broadly, are used to being high achieving, high performing, extremely kind of bright people by necessity because they felt that obviously no community is a monolith, but I think in a lot of cases, people feel like they need to do that to compensate for the way the world reacts to their, their, their identity or, or other parts of them that, uh, they don't have control over. So the parts that they do have control over, they feel like they have to be hypermanaged. They have to be, um, you know, the sort of the best little boy in the world to, to quote the, you know, another book on that topic. Um, and, and so I think that that for me was how I, responded initially was was to sort of not talk about it not make it a thing um try and kind of keep my head down and be that you know good and loving son and family member who worked really hard studied really hard you know did did well for himself and and would make his family proud 
And I think that um, as I have gotten older, I, I, I wonder whether I really did myself a disservice there in not kind of elevating the issue earlier or making it making it something that wasn't just something that we talked about once and then brushed under the rug forever. Um, and so as I got older, you know, I decided that it, that it was something I did want to talk about more and I sort of forced the issue. And I think ultimately that has to be situational for everybody because, you know, people have different levels of safety and of, um, relationships with their family. But I do think the biggest takeaway there if I could impart anything of value to somebody else is, is that you ultimately have to understand that no individual thing you do is ever going to compensate for who you are, because you also shouldn't have to do that. You don't have to compensate for who you are. You have to just be who you are. And, um, and I think that there's, we, we set people up for disappointment, for failure and for emotional uh, struggles when we tell them that it'll get better at some point, maybe it will. And, and, and maybe it won't, maybe the thing that gets better is you just get a new, you know, you get a new, um, situation, you go to a new place, you, you build a new family, you have a chosen family. I think sometimes we, in our desire to comfort people or, or to be responsive and, and be available, we lean on phrases or, or ideas or concepts that maybe aren't universally applicable. And so I always think about that because so many times people told me, you know, that, that people would come around and, and then, you know, you wait 10, 15 years and you feel like they haven't. And um, ultimately that makes you think that you did something wrong because it's mm-hmm. like, well, if all these people told me that they would come around and they didn't, you know, what did I do wrong to, to make that not happen? And I think that that is, uh, one of the ways where where I would say to people, if anyone asked, you know, you have to kind of chart your own course in that sense and 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 adjust your own expectations based on your lived experience because you ultimately mm. are the person who knows your situation best. I think nobody else on the outside will ever know or understand it, but but there's a big world out there, and and I think you know, going living in London, living in New York, living in DC, I found my people. I found people who had similar experiences or had very different ones, but but were um, kind of aligned in in a bunch of different ways. And and yeah, it it definitely has improved both with my family and and with my own individual life. I mean, I'm very very happy and and um, and engaged, and um, you know, I, I think that that they're there's a, there, there's a great big world and, and a lot of promise and, pros- and possibility, but you have to, I think you have to chart your own course and be mindful about your expectations in a way that takes care of you, not kind of adjust to what other people want for you. Thank you for sharing all that, Kindred. Um, could I ask, um, was, I suppose where I'm coming from this is that I, I'm engaged in therapy myself uh, on a personal level, but also through my studies in, in studying psychotherapy and counseling. And um, it, was that part of your experience in, in navigating all this, uh, particularly perhaps during your college years and onwards, because you, you definitely seem to have a lot of, um, clarity and insight. And obviously people can arrive at that level of clarity on their own volition, but often they need external sort of supports around that as well. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it, it wasn't formally part of my, of my process, but I do think that I benefited from a lot of really, really mindful people who were in my life and who provided resource um, resources or or counsel it was something that was part of my my training when i after undergraduate i did the the episcopal service corps in in north carolina and we did service leadership trainings and uh, on fridays and we would do a lot of literature readings and and uh kind of the idea was around building your spiritual practice and it was rooted in um in Anglican or or Episcopal uh, traditions, but, but a lot of it was around, you know, creating mindfulness, creating space for thinking about um, the way in which we operate in the world and live in the world and, and how we forgive, how we forgive ourselves, how we forgive others, how we operate from a mindset of abundance, not of scarcity. And, and I think that that's something that ultimately really kind of adjusted my own thinking but I think the other part was just time. And I think maybe, maybe in, in some ways I have, you know, for over half my life now, I've been responding to the way that others responded to me. Um, and I think that that has shifted how I 
think about it because there's just been a lot of time to ruminate and a lot of time to give myself and others kind of grace to be where we are at any given point in time. Mm -hmm. But I also think that part of it was, you know, my parents to give a, a particular example, when, when I was born, my mother was 25. My father was 28. I turn um, 32 tomorrow. And, you know, the, the, there's nothing like getting beyond the point um, in time where your parents had you and still feeling completely inadequate and, and still feeling uh, completely uh, ill-equipped to, <laughs> to, to keep, yeah. uh, you know, to keep uh, house plants alive, much less uh, children yeah. to realize that everybody's just, everybody's doing the best they can, you know, Absolutely. and, and they, and they love you fiercely and they care about you. And there's no guidebook. There's yeah. nothing that tells you how to be a good anything much less parent and, 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 and support mm. system. So I think mm. part of it was just that, that process of, of getting older and, and, uh, you know, I know it's, it's probably a cliche, but I do think at least for me, it's certainly true. The, the older I get, the wiser my parents and other family members seem and, and are. Um, but the thing is, I think they already, you know, they, they already had that. It just took me a while to realize that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was struck there by your um, the service and the reflection uh, that you undertook uh, in relation to perhaps scriptures and obviously having a, a religious influence come to bear there. But, um, you know, the sense that religion or at least some religions or, or sadly most religions um, cause a lot of harm or at least their interpretations cause a lot of harm in relation to uh, the gay community and the mm. LGBT, the broader LGBTQ communities. Um, but yet, like most things, it's, it's, it's often not black or white or binary in that the same traditions gave you a lot of sustenance and growth and inspiration to almost help you navigate. And mm. it's, it's interesting to me that, you know, that seems still very much alive in you, but yet you've found your own course with it um what well firstly am i reading that accurately and secondly do you have any form of practice or systems at present in which to that you use to sustain yourself yeah it's it's such a good question and i think it's something that i i'm not sure that i have a sufficient answer to i think um you know my my own interpretation of my religious tradition so i i grew up um protestant and and christian i i think my my understanding of the world and and the sort of fundamental sense of of what we are called to do as as good you know community members neighbors citizens is certainly informed by that and and you know, as I got older, I um, when I was an undergraduate, I actually took a took a class, uh, an elective course. I went to a liberal arts college, so you know, sometimes things, the course offerings were a bit eclectic to say the least. But one of them was uh, was called "Who Is Jesus," and it was all about you know, kind of critically reading a bunch of different interpretations and 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 um, and assessments of of Christianity, of of Christ, of like the philosophies and um, and you know, uh, a number of different kind of angles there and i i felt from that point very very compelled by this idea of of radical justice of of um christianity at its core as a call for radical justice for radical equality for radical community um and the idea of being you know in in the world but not of the world i think is particularly powerful not maybe in the ways that it's been applied by some people um, as a sense of, of being an exclusionary or, or um, marginalizing metric, but, but rather as, a, as this idea of sort of eschewing the ideas of the world at large. So, you know, not thinking about capitalism for capitalism's sake, not thinking about environmental degradation for profit, you know, not thinking about... Um, exclusion or marginalization based on on identity or um you know characteristics i i see when i when i choose to look at scripture or or religious teachings and i'm i have to say i'm i'm not um i'm not 
deeply, deeply involved um, as much as as much as you know my my family or others would would like me to be, I'm sure. But um, but I do see a call for compassion for the poor, for the marginalized, for people who are facing persecution, for people who need help, people who are you know refugees or asylum seekers, and and that informs my own idea of of, of social justice for sure, and and has I think from the beginning I I felt early on a a dissonance between the religious communities, particularly, I think, in um, in the United States that are so deeply aligned with political parties that mm. I almost see a sort of, um, you know, extreme acrobatics, basically, to sort of contort themselves in a way that that makes ideological sense, you know, that you can be for extractive yeah, 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 yeah. policies for war for mm-hmm. for um any number of things right and 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 claim that mantle because what i see when i look at christianity and when i look at christ is 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 a social movement and a movement leader and and ultimately a call for radical justice for um for compassion for equity and mm-hmm. so i think um when i to the extent that i claim that that tradition and, and that mantle i claim it through that lens because i think that in my mind it is not a rewriting of of that of that idea or that text but rather a reorienting to what it always was i don't yeah. think that it's revisionist i think it's it's um restorative yeah yeah i would i would share that view as well um i certainly get a sense that uh over two thousand years or more um too many um agendas and egos have got involved in rewriting mm. narratives and uh, to, to suit those agendas and that if there was a, a figure of Jesus around today, he would more than likely kick their ass in a peaceful, <laughs> nonviolent way in, in the money lender sense of the word. But if we right if we, turning over tables in the church, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. Um, and if we strip it all back that, you know, you, you mentioned love as a verb and if, if, if this Jesus character was 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 here uh, or was there that if, if love is the the be end and all ultimately the guiding force then then really we don't have these issues of prejudice discrimination or division because it sort of conquers all ultimately mm. Um, mm. but I guess that's the big that's the big mission. <laughs> and if it was easy, we, we would be there already. Um, so I guess it's yeah. a process, which is why it's a verb, um, you know. Um, so, Kindred, let's move along. And, um, you know, for, for maybe the, the last almost decade or so, you've been deeply immersed in the world of community organizing, NGOs, civil society. You've spent time in London and in D.C., uh, and elsewhere, you've you've traveled a lot more, obviously, in time in New York City as well. Um, can you talk to me about some of the organizations you've worked with and some of the experiences, the groups and the insights that you've had over the years? Sure. Yeah, happy to. I started my my career in this world um, when I was in graduate school in in the UK. I, I worked for an organization called Redress, which focused on um, on reparations for victims um, and survivors of, of torture, um, particularly people who had been political prisoners or, or targets of, of repressive regimes. And, and that was something that I was doing while I was getting a master's in international relations. And I always knew that I wanted to do something in the human rights world, but having that experience to get to really do that work while I was at university and, and experience that was incredible. I, I was able to attend the Global Summit and Sexual Violence and Conflict that that was hosted at the time by um, the UK Foreign Secretary and uh, and represent redress there. And, and it was just an amazing early exposure to international activism and advocacy that w- that was going on um, on behalf of um, you know a, a very very um, important cause and 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 issue. I. When I left the UK, I had the opportunity to, I knew that I wanted to do civil and human rights work and I wasn't quite sure where I wanted to go. I, I felt very strongly that I wanted to go to Washington or to New York just because those in, you know, in, in my country are the, the centers of power for, for NGO work and, and uh, advocacy and, and activism in particular. Um, but I had an offer to go to the Southern Poverty Law Center, which was in um, in Montgomery, Alabama. And there was part of me that was 
really, really hesitant to go back so soon uh, because I had I had left in in 2012. This was 2014. I didn't really want to do that coming from London, going back to Montgomery, which is very, I mean, it's three and a half hours south of where I grew up and very, very different. Um, Alabama, for those who don't know, is uh, kind of a mixture of everything from the mountains in the in the north, the Appalachian foothills, to uh, to the to the Gulf Coast um, at the very bottom, and and basically everything in between. Uh, every sort of landmass that you find in the southeast is is in Alabama because it runs north to south, and and so um, I grew up in the in the the foothills and and what you would view as as more of an Appalachian um, foothills sort of place. Montgomery is very very old uh traditional kind of low-lying south uh southland and the culture is a lot slower as a result and and very very different so i was a little um unsure about that but the work was incredible and i knew that i i knew that if i were to be going back to the united states to do work in civil and human rights that that southern poverty law center was one of the best places to do it regardless of where it was and and so i was really grateful to take that opportunity and that shaped my my own sense of how to integrate um domestic policy domestic civil rights and view it through the intersecting lenses of, of international human rights of international campaigns and and um you know i think that too often people think of them, them as silos but but ultimately what happens in one country can can lead to ripple effects elsewhere i mean if you look at the nonviolent uh protest movements around the world and how they've been informed by each other or the social media revolutions that have happened from uh from the arab spring to me too to black lives matter you know what happens in one part of the world definitely affects the others and so i felt very very grateful to have that experience and um and that ultimately led me to new york to to work um on media and advocacy for a couple of trials they were doing there actually around um lgbt Q uh, conversion therapy and and putting an end to that practice and and that felt really very personally um, you know important to me uh, for a number of reasons but um, I ended up getting an offer to to move to New York and work alongside uh, Amnesty International and Oxfam through a joint campaign they had called Control Arms at the United Nations and given what I had done in international relations I really really welcomed that opportunity so I moved to New York. Um, lived with six other people in, you know, a shotgun row house uh, apartment in Brooklyn, and and made it work for a few years. But, um, but loved that experience and loved loved the chance to meet people from all over the world. Um, ultimately, over time, it led me to a number of different organizations, and I found a mix. Uh, I think a nice mix, but an unexpected mix of domestic and international organizations. I ended up working for the Vera Institute of Justice, which is one of the largest criminal justice reform organizations in the in the US and they also do immigration reform. I was really fortunate to get to to build a digital team there from from scratch. I started as the only digital person and when I left we were a team of four and and I was able to really grow my own skills and and abilities there and really grateful for that opportunity. Um but it was an interesting time because it was you know it was the Trump years and there was this weird mixture of optimism on the criminal justice reform front because there was a bipartisan consensus that it was important. At the same time there was an over you know, almost overnight assault on on immigration and immigrants' rights, mm -hmm. and so um, it was a deeply, deeply stressful position to kind of constantly be doing communications work there because it was um, one five alarm fire after another, and you know you would be doing something on Saturday night at eleven. And I felt um, I felt by the end of it extremely grateful for that work, but I also understood why generations of of kind of movement and advocacy comms people before me had talked about burnout and had talked about needing uh, a change of pace. So I, I moved into philanthropy, um, doing communications for a progressive foundation and, um, and really enjoyed that, that step back from, from the kind of more frenetic pace in a way that still allowed me to feel connected to the movements, allowed me to still feel like I was playing a, playing an important role in, in helping, um, helping kind of tell the story of of uh of organizations that maybe didn't have the infrastructure or the communications team to do that um on their own and over time i um i realized because i'd i'd had a, as i mentioned a number of different experiences and i realized that i really liked 
project work and time specific work and jumping kind of around and being able to have my hand in a lot of different jars because I felt that a lot of organizations were internally focused and weren't really thinking about the external landscape of what's going on, not only in the world, but among their peers and kind of learning from each other and incorporating best practices. Because I think there was a zero sum thinking and maybe still is among some nonprofits that someone else's success or gain necessarily implies your loss. You know, you, if they're getting something, you must not be. And so there was a hesitance to share kind of best practices or, or strategies there. And so I started doing some consulting kind of as a hobby um, and on the side early on and, and, and most of it for free and really realized I loved it. And I love that I could take something I was learning in one place and apply it elsewhere and give people that connective tissue that I didn't see happening in the broader world. Mm-hmm. So since yeah. I've started consulting, I've been really, really fortunate to work with a number of organizations, but um, some that, that I think uh, your listeners might be familiar with include um, USAID, which is the, you know, the US government's um, international development fund uh, and, and program, um, Global Citizen and New America, Girl Rising, um, all over the board, you know, a lot of organizations from international development, ending gender-based violence, ending extreme poverty, fighting hate and extremism, uh, working for vaccine equity and and um, the IP access waivers to allow other countries to produce vaccines rather than simply get get donated vaccines. Um, I think it kind of runs the board, but but the thing that has been so amazing to me is that I I feel like every single step of my career helped inform what came next, yeah. but there was no, there was no overarching strategy at the time that, you know, I, I wasn't following a five or 10 year plan. And I, and I heard someone say once, and I think it's, I think it's really, really true, at least for me and valuable that you, you only tell yourself a narrative of, of your trajectory after it's happened. You know, we all find ways to rationalize kind of Absolutely. how it happened, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't obvious at the time, right? It's, yeah. it's just in retrospect. Yeah, I, I absolutely uh, identify with that. And I, in many ways, you know, I, I, I feel like strategy is important insofar as it's possible uh, that there's so many unknowns that we're navigating at any given time. And in many ways, I suppose my own spiritual understanding is that ultimately when all is said and done, so much of it is a great mystery. And it's about how we learn to navigate and dance and walk with grace in that great mystery. Um, and in terms of your new undertaking, the new consultancy and the work that you do, and, you know, I heard a couple of times you mentioned just the, the frenetic work pace, the overachievement, the type A, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I would also identify with some of that where my, you know, my wife goes away. Um, I don't necessarily uh, hit the couch and what binge out on Netflix. I just do a ton of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, And it's like at some level, there's a dangerous compulsion there that I just I I love working but it doesn't always serve me uh in the mm-hmm. sense that I end up dealing with fatigue and uh the danger of burnout always being there I haven't experienced it severely at one point in my life and possibly a multiple mini burnout periods but thankfully have now developed new insights and practices that I can see warning signs and I can see the behaviors and habits and tendencies but mm-hmm. have how are you navigating that kind of push and pull factor, not just in your own life, but in how you seek to implement a new culture, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's I think it's something that I've been thinking a lot about for about a year now because I I've read some some incredible pieces on um, and Helen Peterson had an amazing essay in in BuzzFeed a couple of years back about millennials and burnout. And I think it really resonated with me at the time, just because of what I mentioned before with the the sort of frenetic pace of of the communications work in in immigration and criminal justice reform space, um, particularly I think because of the the always on culture. You know, in communications, there's there is a, a definite pressure to be responsive and to be um, to be doing work kind of at, at all hours of the day. And you know, I I don't think I. I'm alone in that. In fact, I know I'm, I'm, I'm not in, in the research I've, I've done as I was kind of trying to figure out a solution from, from my perspective and, and in my own work and, and business, 
know, I found that 58% of people who work in consulting experience uh, repeating repeating symptoms of, of burnout, um, which is to say kind of sustained and, and, uh, conditional, not, not something that, you know, um, is, is temporary, but, but is more chronic. And when you think about the, the kind of modern economy, there are, especially now with the great resignation and, and, uh, the changes that a lot of people are making after COVID we've got in, in the United States, we've got nearly 60 million freelance workers, you know, who are either contractors, who are consultants, who are gig workers, who are doing their own thing. And many of them are doing multiple jobs. Um, and so, you know, I was, as I was reading all of this, I was thinking to myself that there, there has to be a better system that we can create because we live in, you know, we live in the, the culture that is created for us. But I think to the extent that any of us have power to change that, especially if we are working on our own as a, you know, as a, a solo, um, a, a sole entrepreneur or a solo freelancer or consultant, you know, you can start to sort of change those practices in your own life and take what you learn to, to help others or to at least share those, those findings and, and, and see what happens with it. You know, I felt that I was last year, I was incredibly lucky to have a lot of, a lot of work and, and a lot of amazing experiences. I got to <clears throat> go to the G20 and to COP26 and a number of other things and, you know, would have 70, 80 hour work weeks. And I just felt at the end of the year that I had failed somehow, even as by every, you know, objective measure, I had been successful because the failure was that I didn't feel happy about any of it. I felt depleted. I felt more critical of myself, not less. Um, and the more I tried to do, the less I felt I was doing any of it particularly well. Yeah. And so I felt that I had to get to a point where either I would scale back or scale up, but I couldn't stay the same. And either way, I knew that I wanted to create a framework for sustainability, well-being, um, workplace culture that worked for me so that it could work for other people. You know, before I think a lot of people tell you, you know what, just 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 build your business figure it out as you go, bring people in to support you and culture comes later. I, I really didn't want that to be the case. Yeah. I wanted culture to be baked in from the beginning. And, you know, so I was asking myself really tough questions of, of like, is there, a con is there a consulting model that isn't just tied to what the client wants and being immediately responsive and, and giving them everything and working 16 hour days every single day? Um, and I'm very, much a, I'm very much a 32, you know, Google Chrome tab, browser person at all times i only I 32 like, <laughs> that's <laughs> per window per yeah, window yeah um, and and Guilty. you know i love to i love to, to to sort of open something to read later and and really make my way down the rabbit hole and as i as i read more and more i i you know i came across a lot of the work that is happening in in um Scandinavia in particular around um around the four-day work week model and was really really drawn to that idea and thought you know what this is the time, the place, the position of life to try it. Um, people are already getting used to remote working. They're getting used to, you know, consultants being on in different time zones or in different places and responding when they can. And so I wanted that to be something that was part of the, of the company as we were building out and, and, um, you know, enforcing paid, paid leave, enforcing, um, better benefits, making sure that contractors and freelancers are actually paid enough to, to afford their own health insurance, which fortunately in Ireland is not something that you have to worry about. But in yeah. the United States, um, if you don't have a full-time employer, the cost of insurance is on you. And, you know, 60 million Americans freelancing is an awful lot of people to not have health insurance by default. So what would it look like if we built a model that built in rates that allowed them to pay for all of that? And that's, that's, those were sort of the, mm. the kinds of things I was thinking about on my own um, in my own experience, because, you know, I was figuring it all out by myself initially. But like I said, if you have the, if you learn all of those things and you have the experiences, why not use them to try and help other people and, and share that so that we can create a better system that is more equitable. And ultimately, if we're working with social justice organizations, which I do, and all my clients so, so far have been nonprofit organizations, you know, I feel a duty to use their funds appropriately as well, because they're paying me and they are tax exempt organizations. They are getting, um, you know, benefits as, as charitable organizations. And I like to think of myself as a sort of satellite extension of that 
of that mission, that vision, those values, and and reflect them in my own, even if I'm not technically a nonprofit organization, because I think it's just the authenticity I want to bring to the work. Mm. Well, it 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 is also the case that these organizations often or sometimes don't necessarily. I mean, they can be excellent at at. Uh, at promoting and cultivating the values externally within the community and so on, but the practice internally isn't mm. always in harmony with the mission or the value base. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can only go so far as to affect change with other organizations. Um, you know, there's all sorts of factors at play. You mentioned culture and governance being another one. Uh, leadership is a big question, but the, the only thing at the end of the day, most of us are in control of is ourselves. And mm. you, by virtue of starting to model a behavior set and a cultural set, can affect the change. So in effect, what I'm hearing is be the change here is that, mm. and I think there is a generational shift and I'm conscious of a, a friend of mine, Joe O'Connor, who's now the chief executive of the four day week global. He's based in the United States now. And um, it feels to me that the four day week is eventually going to become, hopefully, like the weekend is, you'd be going, mm -hmm. well, why not? You know, because it's over yeah. 100 years later since we had the weekend as a concept. At, at some point, people were going, you can't be crazy. You're going to take two days off. And <laughs> um, but there has been a regressive yeah. push uh, over the last 30 years or so. I, I will always sort of blame Thatcherism, but, you know, in, in mm. whatever guise it, you might want to frame it, but it's been a, a pushback and a cutback of workers' rights. And like, if our wellness and our happiness and our minds and our families and our communities are, aren't benefiting from the culture that we're, we're operating from, then what ultimately is the point of it all? So, yeah, uh, I certainly welcome the fact that you're, um, proposing to embody that. And I suspect that, <laughs> I suspect it's not that easy also, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's definitely difficult, um, not only externally, but also internally. I think, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an urge that I have um, after years of, of using any free time I had to, to think about how to innovate, how to come up with a, a cool new campaign or idea for someone I was working with. You know, I, I've tried to kind of use my, I mean, we're talking on a Friday. This is technically a day that I'm not working and I'm talking uh -huh. about work. Caught. So it's not a, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're both caught. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the, um, I think the, you know, the, the, the framework there is, is that I wanted a day to breathe, to have some time to actually think, because ultimately, yeah. you know, I don't know how many of your listeners are, are creatives, but I would imagine uh, a, a fair lot of them. Mm. And ultimately, if we operate solely by the terms of an extractive economy that wants us to produce at all costs, as creatives, the well is going to run dry. I mean, you have to have time to recharge, you have time Absolutely. have to have time to rest. And I think if you are prioritizing that in the same way that you're prioritizing creating good work, being accountable, sharing your, your schedule in advance so you can work something out with your client, it's ultimately going to serve them better as well because what you produce, what you create, and how you're able to show up for work are all going to be drastically better if you have a higher quality of life, if you mm -hmm. have a better work-life balance, if you have a chance to step away and and just read a couple magazines that are going to spark an idea, you know, or listen to a podcast every time where you yeah. hear an insightful new idea. I think it that's where I get my ideas, you know, and 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 if you're never taking time away to do that, I think the work suffers. And so I think we have to get away from this idea that getting away from work means you're not doing anything of value. I think sometimes getting away from work is the thing of value. It's what allows us to show up better the next time. Absolutely. And and also the fact that work need not be the end goal here, that the in many ways the traditional purpose of work was to create income for food and shelter and, and exactly. living life, you know? So exactly. I, I like that, that we're at a point of re-questioning that. And in, in our mutual defense, I will offer that um, I, I also do not take, uh, I'm not on a four day week, but I do not schedule uh, most things on a Friday, even though we are recording on a Friday. Um, but this does not <laughs> this feel is fun, like Rory. work to It's me. not work. Yeah, it's exactly. It's not work. I like, you know, and I, I, <laughs> actually intentionally never uh, developed this podcast as a work project for that reason. Mm. 
that there was a point in time where I thought about scaling it up and and maybe still will do, but it has to be resourced in such a way that it doesn't feel like burdensome. And so every conversation I do, I enjoy. And that's that's my modus, you know, and I think yeah. you have to keep that sense of joy alive. Um, so, Kindred, I think uh, our time is, well, firstly, I want to kick you off air because I want you to go and to enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there, there is a lot more we could talk about um, and we, we have covered an awful lot. But is there anything you would like to conclude with yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I really appreciate you you kind of diving into the into the things that that make people who they are. I, I'm a listener. I, I started listening back in 2019, and um, and I I really appreciate that. I I think it's it's so interesting to have the opportunity to talk about things in a way that just show how they inform what you what you do, who you become, um, rather than focusing on what you did and who you became. Um, because I think that ultimately we all have a story that informs why we're doing what we're doing, why we love what we love. Um, and, and I, you know, I would say that the thing for me is probably the full circle moment is, um, you know, as part of this, this, this endeavor that I've gone on to kind of strike out and try and create something family culture and my background was something that was really, really critical in how I thought about what that would look like. And, and the last, the, the last piece that I just wanted to share as part of that is, um, you know, in addition to trying to create kind of a sustainable working environment for myself and, and for others, I really wanted to build in literally paying it forward and literally giving back, um, to the places that, that kind of helped make me who I am. Um, at some point I would love to, to, to do that for others who are part of the team. Um, but I, would love to encourage anyone who who might know of of um, amazing organizations in the south uh, of the United States um, in or or in Appalachia that are doing incredible work to um, to check out um, our website our website um, for for our company because we're going to be giving um, an unrestricted general operating grant to an organization there and that was something that was very very important to me because I think. Um, I think this is something that happens all over the world. And I know it's a thing in Ireland as well with people who grew up in small communities and small towns, usually for economic necessity or reasons beyond their control, mm -hmm. they feel they have to leave the communities that made them to be able to do whatever career it is they want. Um, I hope that changes with the remote world, yeah. but I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure that it will and to the degree that it needs to. Um, so I, I very much wanted to be even though I'm now in DC and, and not living in the South and not part of that community um, in a day-to-day -day basis, I wanted that to be part of my own operational strategy. You know, how do, what does it look like to give back and, and literally give back in an accountable way? So we're really excited um, as a company to, to be giving um, an unrestricted grant to, to an organization there that's doing civil and human rights work. And, and I'm so excited to, to embark on that process. So if you do know of anyone, I encourage you to, to check out um, our website, which hopefully we can maybe put in the show notes. But, um, but yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is just to anybody who's listening and, and considering something like this, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's been such an immensely valuable experience for me um, to get to meet so many different people do work with a number of diff different issue areas and learn from each and every one of them and then have that inform my own strategies of, of what does it mean to be a good you know um, community member global citizen local citizen um, friend and neighbor and, and and so i'm i'm super grateful for for you ruri for for providing the opportunity to, to chat about this and and for all the work that you're doing i really appreciate the the concept of of just kind of deconstructing whatever corporate speak or or ngo speak people you know people usually do with their days and and um i've really enjoyed this conversation so thank you so much for providing a platform oh, an absolute pleasure thank you kindred i really appreciate it and really enjoyed it some great um insights and stories and it was great to learn more about you after being in touch over the years and i know you you were an early adapter to the podcast so grateful for that <laughs> and uh yeah just uh, I, I will just give that website now i think from what i recall it's kmstrategiesgroup.com is that right yes that's right great thanks again kindred absolute pleasure talking to you and best thank of luck so with all much. the great work and keep those fridays free <laughs> <laughs> will do thank you <laughs> 
Hello, Rory here again. A huge thanks to Kindred for taking the time to talk with me and for sharing some of his inspiring journey and insights. If you know others who might like to hear this episode, please do send them a link and mention it on social media. You can also help the podcast reach more people by subscribing to the Love and Courage podcast in your podcast app. This means you get updates on each episode and also ratings and reviews in the apps are really appreciated. You can find me also Rory McKiernan on various social media platforms and I have an email newsletter on my website head over to loveandcourage.org where you can also choose to chip in as a once-off or a monthly patron and a huge thanks to all who do that already and a reminder that if you want information on my book Hitching for Hope just head over to hitchingforhope.com that is it folks a huge thanks again for listening thanks to everyone who's part of the Love and Courage community thanks for all your love and support until next time